Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. I'll be introducing our guest for today uh, in just a moment. Uh, first, I wanted to just say a couple things. First of all, uh, yesterday was the 100th birthday of my favorite actress and another great Irish American, Maureen O'Hara. This is her autobiography. And uh, so she was born one day, as it turns out, before uh, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which we're celebrating today, uh, on August 18, 1920. That was ratified. And uh, you can learn more about that this week on Thursday when our new People's University begins with Anne Marie LaFosso, who's a law professor at West Virginia University. And we'll talk about the history of suffrage, the suffrage struggle. And it's a six part series. So that is the first in the series. And if you uh, ask a relevant question at the event, you'll be able to win this 500 piece round table called Votes for Women. All the great suffragists, Susan B. Anthony and all of um, are on there and you'll be entered in a raffle to win that. So join us Thursday at 6.30 p.m. for the struggle for women's rights. Uh, our guest today spoke at Lunch with Books last year in February about uh, Frederick Douglass' visit to Ireland that most of us were not aware of. And she has a new book coming out about several abolitionists, black abolitionists who visited Ireland. Uh, her name is Christine Kinley. She is also the author of Charity and the Great Hunger, The Kindness of Strangers. She was inducted into the Irish America Hall of Fame, so another great Irish American. She is professor of history and director of Ireland's uh, Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. She earned her PhD uh, at Trinity College in Dublin, and she's been here in the States since 2007. She's gonna tell you today about the Choctaw and their gift to Ireland during the Great Hunger. Here's Christine Kindley. Hi, Sean. Um, I can't see you, but I know you're there. And thank you so much for inviting me back. I wish I could be with you in Wheeling again. I had such a great visit. Um, you made me feel very welcome, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this online program. Um, as people know, it is live. So I'm just warning you, I am sharing the house currently with two dogs, two young people. So Things might go crazy, we hope not, but just in case something jumps on my knee, it's a dog. So um, in terms of my background, my PhD was on workhouses uh, with a special emphasis on workhouses during the famine. So I'm known mostly for my work on the great hunger as it's more um, readily known in the United States. But over the last few years, I became interested in Daniel O'Connell and his role in the abolitionist movement. And through that, I then became interested in Frederick Douglass. And that led me in a totally sort of different direction. But in one way, it's the same direction, because I think the umbrella that holds my work together or shelters my work or protects my work is my interest in social justice and human rights. And I think both topics really fit into that. So. Today I'm sort of returning to my roots, but with some update, and it's the Choctaw gift to Ireland. So, as Sean says, I've written about this before. I first wrote about it in my first mage book, which came out in 1994, This Great Calamity. I had heard about the Choctaw gift and I wrote about it. And then I was always very intrigued by the idea of so many people, and some of them who were themselves very poor and marginalised, sent money to Ireland. You know, how did they know? Why did they do it? All these questions. So a few years ago, I actually started to do research on this topic and it resulted in my book, I think one of my favorite books, Charity and the Great Hunger in Ireland. And when I'm reading, I'm still doing research on the Great Hunger, even though it's not my major research at the moment, but I keep coming across more and more donations. So this book really could be updated and I've recently been involved with bringing out a book on other famines in Ireland. There were many famines in Ireland. This was just the most severe. And again, during every famine, it is amazing who gave to Ireland. So that, as I call it, the kindness of strangers, is a story that just keeps coming back to me and continues to inspire me, especially in times like the ones we're going through. The other book I just have put up is 
Um, a few years ago, I wrote a graphic novel with a great artist from Boston, John Walsh, and it was actually based on a, a painting from 1846 that we have in Ireland's Great Hunger Museum, which is also part of Quinnipiac. And it's just three children sitting on a rock and you can really get their personality. And I was very intrigued because obviously these children were real children. We knew nothing else about them, not even the location. And so John and I based this graphic novel on our imagination of what might have happened to the three children. And one reason why it um, interests me and why I've got it up on screen is because we put a dog in the story and the dog became very much the the glue that bound the story together. And the dog, I hope you can see in the bad times, is a dog called Koo, and that is based on my real life dog. So Koo might appear at some stage during this broadcast, but um, the dog in the book really exists. So that's a long handed way of saying um, my research has been on the Great Famine and the charitable aspect is something that you know, I've spent a great deal of time looking at, but would like to get back to at some stage. So. Irish history is complicated, uh, fascinating, and I always like to give some context and 800 years of Irish history because I think it's really hard to understand something like the Great Hunger unless we can see Ireland in terms of being a colony. As we say, England's first colony and some would say England's last colony. So just to go back to Ireland, England, Britain's first colony. So Ireland has been a colony of Britain since the 12th century. So it really is the old colony. And this colonization came about in a piecemeal way. And initially it was because of two kings. One of them at that stage in the 12th century, Ireland had five kings. They would then elect a high king. And one of the kings, Dermot, who you see at the bottom of the screen, fell out with the other kings. They expelled him from his kingdom, which roughly equates to the Wexford Waterford area today. And he wanted to win back his kingdom, so he appealed to the king of England and France. At that time, they shared a monarch, it was called the Angevin Empire. And the king of that time was Henry II, who you see at the top of the screen looking very resplendent. And Henry had, for many years, wanted to invade Ireland. So this was a perfect opportunity, an invitation by an Irish king. So, of course, he wanted something in return. He was too busy in France, but he sent some of his finest knights, led by a knight called Strongbow. And Strongbow made a deal that if he defeated the Irish and won back the property, the lands for Dermot, he would in return be able to marry Dermot's daughter, Aoife. And that's indeed what he did. And this, again, a very idealised view of the battle scene and the marriage which took place at the end of the battle. Of course, it didn't happen like that. This is paintings from the 1840s, but it captures the spirit, the idea of this new bonding between England and Ireland. So the Normans had their own chronicler, their own historian, a man called Gerard of Wales. He was a holy man, a religious man, and Welsh. And he wrote about the Irish and he wrote about them in very uncomplimentary terms. Um, he kept saying they were a barbarous people, clearly his favorite word. I went out to outline why they were barbarous. Irish men had beards and moustaches, clearly something suspicious going on. So from the very outset, Ireland, Irish people within their own country were represented by the colonizers as being second class. And of course, this continues jumping forward because I want to get through a lot of information. When we come to the time of Henry VIII, most of Ireland had been conquered, not all of it, but most of it. And Henry did a few things which were major changes. Uh, he wanted an annulment of his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. The Pope wouldn't give it to him. So he broke with the Church of Rome. And instead, he uh, established the Anglican Church in England, which gradually spread to Scotland and Wales. He tried to impose Protestantism in Ireland. Of course, it never succeeded. But this gave him a justification for closing down and taking away the riches of the fantastic monasteries that had been built in Ireland over the previous centuries. And you know, if you go to Ireland, you'll see the ruins of these magnificent buildings. They were almost like cathedrals. They were like universities. So much life was centered in the monasteries. So he took away their wealth. 
He also, and this was maybe a tribute to his ego, declared himself to be King of Ireland. No previous English monarch had done that. They had been the Lords of Ireland. So that was a major change. His daughter Elizabeth succeeded him, and during her very long reign, there was a revolt led by this man, the second Earl of Tyrone, Hugh O'Neill. And it lasted a number of years, and he was almost successful. He appealed to Spain for help, but it all went disastrously wrong. And so in 1603, he had to swear loyalty to Queen Elizabeth I. At this point, she was dead. Nobody bothered to tell him that, but he swore loyalty. And for some historians, 1603 marks the end of this long period of the conquest of Ireland. Hugh O'Neill was allowed to live, but he suspected at some stage he would be killed for his treason. And so in 1607, he left Ireland. It's called the Flight of the Earls, and he sought exile in Rome. Hugh O'Neill was from Tyrone and his followers were mostly from the north of the country and this left a power vacuum. And this power vacuum was filled by the new king who installed what was called the plantation of Ulster. Protestants from England and Scotland were encouraged to come to the north of Ireland and fill this power vacuum. Land was taken from the native Catholics and given to the Protestants. And most of the settlers who came were Scottish Presbyterians. But this explains to this day why the north of Ireland, the area that roughly equates with what is now Northern Ireland is predominantly Protestant, while the rest of Ireland is Catholic. So another major um, step in the colonization and control of Ireland. Uh, sometime after, penal laws were introduced, mostly against Catholics, not totally, and these penal laws made it impossible for Catholics to progress socially or economically. They were deprived of the vote, of the ability to buy land, of the ability to build churches, hence mass rocks, the ability to build schools, etc., etc., etc. And so Catholics were already second class citizens, and this really damaged them and made them very much at the bottom of the social pyramid in their own country. And so this explains why. Irish people had such a dependence on potatoes. By the beginning of the 18th century, Catholics only owned 5% of the land of Ireland. Most of that land was in the west of Ireland, which if you visited, you know, is not always of the best quality and tends to be very rocky. But potatoes, which were not indigenous to Ireland, could grow even in the poorest quality soil. In some of the islands off the west of Ireland, potatoes could even be grown in sand. And potatoes quickly became a favourite with the Irish poor. They were nutritious and they were plentiful. And so you know, when people say, well, why did Irish people eat so many potatoes? You know, surely they knew this was disastrous or they made them vulnerable. But really, it's because of centuries of colonisation, of being dispossessed of their property systematically, they had very few choices. And potatoes made perfect sense. So... Of course, there were various attempts by Irish people to get rid of the British, and a major attempt came in 1798. Interestingly, led by Protestant nationalists, most famously Wolf Tone. This image, it's quite an iconic image, is of the men, although there were women, of 1798 with their pikes. So these men and women fought against the might of the British army, the British military, with pikes. Of course, they were not successful, and the 1798 rebellion was ruthlessly put down. It did lead to a major change, though. In the wake of the rebellion, the British government decided that Ireland no longer could have a parliament in Dublin. And so the Irish MPs, who were exclusively male and exclusively Protestant, were forced to vote themselves out of existence. And after 1800, Ireland was governed from London. And an act of union created a new political entity called the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And to celebrate this new union, this flag was created, the Union Jack, as it's called. So, jumping forward to 1845. In 1845, a mysterious blight appeared on the potato crop in Ireland. Nobody knew what it was, it was a new type of disease, but what they did know was it instantly turned the potato to mush, made it inedible, and there was a terrible, terrible smell. 
In 1845, about 40% of the potato crop was lost. And as I said before, Irish people were used to years of shortages. And so nobody knew that this was the onset of seven years of devastating famine. Unfortunately, in 1846, the blight returned and it returned more virulently than in the previous year. And almost whole of the potato crop was wiped out. There was a new government in place, Lord John Russell was the Prime Minister. He came in promising cheap government and he was immediately confronted with this problem of a second, more devastating year of famine in Ireland. Unfortunately, he introduced relief measures that were inappropriate and ineffective. He made public works the main form of relief, so people who were already hungry had to work on hard labour that achieved nothing except to act as a test of destitution six days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, he didn't regulate food prices, so even though wages were low, food prices were soaring, so there was a very real starvation gap. And he also said that food could be exported from Ireland. He said the market could just regulate. And so massive amounts of food left Ireland as people in Ireland starved. And so it's at the end of 1846 that what we know is the Great Famine or the Great Hunger really commences in Ireland with mass mortality, disease and the start of emigration. And this is just one report. And this woman really existed. We have no photographs of the famine, but at the beginning of 1847, the Illustrated London News sent the very talented Irish artist James Mahoney to the west of Ireland. He went to West Cork, Skibbereen, Skull, etc. And on the way, he encountered this woman carrying a beautiful child. And she wanted some money, and he assumed it was money to feed the child. But as she got closer to his carriage, he saw the child was dead. She wanted money to bury her dead child. So these sort of tragic stories, we know these are people who really suffered. And this is just a report from a government official in Skibbereen saying, upon arriving at Skibbereen, I saw three dead bodies lying in the street which I buried with the help of the constabulary. Deaths are occurring daily in this place. 197 persons have died in the workhouse here since November the 5th. And in that same period, nearly 100 bodies have been found dead in lanes or in derelict cabins, half eaten by rats. And again, some of the stories that emerge from Ireland are graphic in their detail and disturbing. People at this stage, and this is very early stage of the famine, were too weak to prevent being et eaten alive by animals, pigs, dogs, rats, et human beings. So truly awful. So by the end of 1846, it's clear that government relief is failing on a massive scale. And so as government relief is imploding, a massive relief effort takes place spontaneously throughout the world. And it's probably the largest international effort on behalf of a national tragedy. So now I want to talk about that and set it in a bit of context before I get to the Choctaw gift. So some of the first people to get involved were Irish people, the Society of Friends. Again, if you've been to Ireland, you may have had a cup of coffee in Bewley's, a delightful coffee shop. And Joseph Bewley was one of the main people behind this initiative. So at the end of 1846, the Quakers in Dublin set up the Central Relief Committee of the Society of Friends. Now, Quakers were not very numerous in Ireland, there were only about 3,000 of them, but they were very acute, accomplished businessmen, and they were part of a wider international network. And they were also known for their progressive views the Quakers in Ireland were at the forefront of the abolition movement. It was Quakers who welcomed Frederick Douglass to Ireland when he visited in 1845. So the Quakers started to raise money and they knew that what the people needed was not public works. They needed food. So a number of Quakers set about traveling around Ireland and giving people money, mostly women, to set up soup kitchens so that people could have food immediately. And this proved to be very, very effective. And this is a very famous image of a soup kitchen in Cork. Um, in reality, there were probably 
not quite that organized, but you can get the sense of what they needed to do to get food to the people. A tremendous logistical exercise, but they did it. The other very valuable thing that the Quakers did was the people who traveled around Ireland sent reports back to Dublin and reports to the newspapers. And this provided really powerful eyewitness testimony, which was very important at a time when the London Times, for example, was saying it's not as bad. Irish people always exaggerate and this is just exaggerated. So Jonathan Pinn, a successful businessman, traveled to Eris in County Mayo. He described the people as living skeletons and said the culminating point of man's physical degradation seems to have been reached in Eris. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that these people put themselves in personal risk. They were what we would call now first responders. And indeed, at least 13 Quakers died from catching disease during the Great Hunger. So the main committee is in Dublin, but auxiliary committees were formed inside and outside of Ireland. And again, women were particularly active, especially in trying to get clothes, because what they also realised was that when people were without the means of support for any time, they didn't just need food, they needed medicine, they needed bedding, they needed clothing. So women in particular were very effective at bringing clothing, blankets to the Port of Ireland. So a number of auxiliary committees were established in Ireland and in London and in New York. And in New York, the committee was chaired by a man called Minden Van Schack. And he doesn't sound Irish and he wasn't. He was a businessman of Dutch origin. And I'll come back to look at him later. So American donors, who were they? There were a lot of them and some of them are not named and some of them we don't know who they are. But some of the more famous ones you may have heard of, the president of America in 1847, and this is my test to you, maybe I need to give you a prize, but who was the president without looking it up in 1847? More difficult, the vice president. He convened a meeting in February 1847 in Washington and called on all congressmen to return to their districts and create a committee on behalf of Ireland. He was controversial because he owned slaves. So my second question to you, and I'll have to sort out prizes, but who was the vice president in 1847 without looking it up? Um, Abraham Lincoln, at that point a lawyer who had just been elected, he sent $10 to Ireland. Tom Thumb sent a number of donations to Ireland, and there he is, uh, with his very famous manager, P.T. Barnum. And Frederick Douglass sent money to Ireland, interestingly, as we're celebrating women today, to the Women's Committee in Belfast. So it was a very wide range of people who sent money to Ireland. Um, one, the British Relief Association recorded over 15,000 donations. So a lot of people from throughout the world, all parts of the world, sent money to Ireland. And as is always the case, the poor helped the poor during this moment of crisis. So a number of the poor who gave included orphans in New York. Slave churches in the South had many collections. Native Americans in Oklahoma, First Nations in Canada. And it's the Native Americans in Oklahoma I want to speak about today. And according to a London Times article I saw recently, they claimed some dozen tribes of Red Indians have given. So I would think there is a lot more research that could be done on this topic. So just to take us back a few steps to the 1830s, which was a period of devastation, of dislocation for what were known as the five civilized tribes. By a series of treaties, the main one was the Removal Act of 1830, these five nations of people were systematically removed from their lands and forced to relocate. 60,000 Native Americans were moved from their ancestral homes to areas west of the Mississippi that became known as Indian Territory. Today, Oklahoma primarily and Arkansas to some extent. And I'm sad to say that the president at the time was Andrew Jackson, a man who himself had Irish origins. So this is a later imagination of what the Trail of Tears looked like. But you can imagine how traumatic it was just to go back, how many counties they went across nine states, sorry, not counties. I'm thinking I'm back in Ireland, nine states. So this is the Trail of Tears. 
and at least 3,000 died during the journey, maybe 4,000. Again, as with the Irish famine, these people were not regarded as important enough for precise death records to be kept. So, news of the famine in Ireland. By the end of 1846, news of the famine was travelling throughout the world. Newspapers were obviously a main source of what was happening, but word of mouth, letters, pulpits, etc. So people were aware of what was happening in Ireland. And apparently when the Choctaw people heard, they wept of the news from Ireland. But they didn't just weep, they actually did something very, very practical. The Choctaw people held a number of meetings at the beginning of 1847 to raise money for the relief of the starving poor of Ireland. And in early March, they met in Fort Smith in Arkansas. I, sorry, I have print, I want to say Arkansas, I think that's wrong. So I'm not American, I apologize. Arkansas, which is the location of the agency. And the agency was in a sense, the it was a white person who governed the, um, the reservations where the natives were kept. So just very patronizing and, uh, but anyway, a meeting was held and the Choctaws raised $10. And this donation is often overlooked, but this is an early donation, which I came across recently, I think after I'd written my book. And they sent this to a committee in New York the committee we've already talked about, which was working closely with the Society of Friends in Dublin. And another meeting was then convened, and this is Chief Folsom. And this is a large meeting. And interestingly, Chief Folsom had Scottish and Irish ancestry. His mother, though, was pure Native American. And this is maybe more common than you would think, this mixed ancestry. And it's very interesting to see him very much dressed in the Western style here. He, like many others, was had been vehemently opposed to the Indian removal, but it happened. So the meeting was to talk about the white brethren of Ireland. And this large meeting took place in Scullyville in Oklahoma. And the reports vary, but the general consensus is that at this meeting, $170 was sent by the Choctaws to Ireland. And uh, just to give you an idea of how much this was in terms of today 2020 this would be about five and a half thousand dollars so this is a massive massive donation and again it was forwarded to the relief committee in new york and i just want to talk about this committee because again just trying to think of the logistics of the days before mobile phones etc so this money would have been sent in bills Often when people sent notes, they'd, send, they'd cut them in half and send half separately so that nobody could steal them. Uh, so the money would have been sent up to New York. In New York, this man, uh, Van Schack, uh, his committee mostly used the money he received to purchase food and seeds and then to send a number of boatloads stocked with food over to Ireland. And just to come back to him, Van Schack, he has no connection with Ireland. He's a member of the Reformed Dutch Church. He's a financier. He's the man credited with bringing clean water to New York, a founder of New York University. He was a noted philanthropist. At one point, he was asked, why did he do this? He didn't know the Irish, the Irish people in Ireland. Why did he do this? And he responded that it was a labour of love. And I think those words are very beautiful and are very much in contrast with what the British government's attitude towards giving relief in Ireland was. So when these ships sailed to Ireland, it would take about three to four weeks to get to Ireland and then it would be distributed within Ireland. So this whole process was not immediate, not quick, but it happened and it saved many, many lives. So the Choctaw actions actually inspired their neighbours, the Cherokees, to send money to Ireland. And in 1847, the chief of the Cherokees was Chief John Russ, also known as Kuwes Kuwi. It's pretty beautiful. And he convened a meeting and he explained what the Choctaws had done, what had happened in Ireland. 
but also he was again of mixed Scotch Irish ancestry and he knew that the potato had failed in the highlands of Scotland and that the people there were also suffering so he suggested that they should raise money but send it to Ireland and to Scotland and again Chief John Ross a fascinating man um, he like Folsom had opposed the Trail of Tears and during it his own wife had died so he'd suffered incredibly. Again a visionary because he started his own newspaper so the Cherokees actually had their own newspaper. So the Cherokees raised money for Ireland and they sent two donations of $103 and $245. But because they wanted some of their money to go to Scotland, they didn't send it to New York or to the Quakers. They sent it to a committee that had been formed in London, the British Relief Association for the Relief of Distress in Ireland and the Highlands of Scotland. So even though they both raised money, it went two different routes and to two different charitable bodies. Um, the Arkansas Intelligentsia, maybe misnamed, actually commented on what had happened. They wrote, what an agreeable reflection it must give to the Christian and the philanthropist to witness this evidence of civilization and Christian spirit existing among our red neighbors. They are paying the Christian world a consideration for bringing them out of benighted ignorance and heathen barbarism, not only by contributing a few dollars, but by affording evidence that the labors of the Christian missionary have not been in vain. So pretty racist. In Ireland, the gift was acknowledged. By June, the gift must have arrived, the gifts, as I should say, and they were noted in a number of newspapers. So this is from the Belfast newsletter, one of the oldest newspapers in Ireland. The Choctaw tribe of North American Indians have contributed a sum of $170 for the relief of the distressed Irish, $174. The Cork Examiner, and I actually took a picture of it yesterday and included it in here. If you have great eyesight, you might be able to read in the news item. They say it was $269 that the Choctaw sent. That's the only time I've come across that figure, but maybe it was. But anyway, they wrote, Lo, the poor Indian. He stretches his red hand in honest kindness to his poor Celtic brother across the sea. Irishmen never can forget the gratitude which is due for such noble Christian-like conduct. So again, a racial prism, but meant in a different spirit from the previous newspaper. So all this money was pouring into Ireland in 1847 and undoubtedly it saved lives. But with the harvest of 1847, where blight had diminished but not disappeared, the British government said that the famine was over. And if Ireland needed any more relief, it had to come from Irish taxpayers, that they would not give any more money to Ireland. And at the end of 1847, unfortunately, most charitable donations dried up. Maybe they were convinced by what the British government said, and there was some charity fatigue as we no exists today and also some suspicion why are we sending money to ireland when so many irish people are leaving ireland and landing in our countries anyway so it was a mixture of reasons um, but do donations really dried up by 1848, the funds of the Quakers were almost exhausted. And in 1848, they, like the other charitable, charitable bodies that had been established, ended their operations in Ireland. So after 1848, Irish people were mostly left to their own devices. And we know it was disastrous. We, in 1849, we talk about Black 47. Sometimes we, historians, we thought that was maybe the worst year of the famine, but now we think that things were worse in 1849, when homelessness was combined with hunger and was devastating to the Irish people. So the kindness of strangers to Ireland was not forgotten. And especially the Choctaw gift was remembered and has been honored in a number of ways. Um, I first wrote about it, I think I said in 1994, the great Cecil Wooden Smith had written about it in 1962. So historians have remembered it, but not in the great detail it is now remembered. So 
1992, largely due to the work, sorry, my dog has just joined me, who is here, sorry, um, 1992, largely due to the work of the great human rights activist, Derryman um, Dan Mullen, a plaque was erected in Mansion House in Dublin. And if you go to Dublin, please go and see this plaque to commemorate the generosity of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma forcibly removed from Mississippi in 1830, who together with First Nations located in Upper and Lower Canada, responded with immense kindness and compassion towards the suffering Irish during our great famine of 1847. And then goes on to talk about the humanity of this gesture. So certainly that was a great way of honoring the Choctaw. The story was revived again in 1995, which was the sesquicentenary, the 150th anniversary of the first appearance of Blight in Ireland, when there was a great move to remember. And at that point, we had a woman president, Mary Robinson, and she was a woman who is still alive, full of compassion. She was the first head of state to visit a famine stricken area. She visited Somalia and wrote about it. And she heard about the Choctaw donation and she was invited to go and spend time with the Choctaws in Oklahoma. And while she was there, they made Mary an honorary Choctaw chief. And she responded in Choctaw language, which, um, and she apologized for her bad pronunciation, and I won't even try it. But Mary Robinson is an honorary Choctaw chief. Kieran Tui may have made a number of carvings in Irish bog oak. Bog Oak is thousands of years old and it's very, very moving when you see it. So Quinnipiac University, my university, and um, the former president, John Leahy, in 2007, purchased this beautiful piece of sculpture in Bog Oak by Curon, who's based in Galway. And it's thank you to the Choctaw. And the bottom starts off sort of like a totem pole, but then it's hands, feathers, and his concept of the circle of giving, that if you do something good, it will come back to you. And if the museum opens, and if you are visiting Quinnipiac, I would say go and see it. It's a very, very moving piece of art. And then more recently in 2017, the small town of Middleton created this beautiful, beautiful um, installation, six meter tall, and it's feathers, and it's called Kindred Spirits. And you can see it from the road as you go down to Cork, from Dublin to Cork, so you don't even need to get out of your car. And it's just an exquisite piece of imagination. And the feathers are sitting on an empty pot, which symbolizes the hunger of the Irish people. Why Middleton? No particular reason. They just wanted to honor the memory of this gift. And in 2018, Antishuk, um, Leo Var Varadka, visited the Choctaw people for St. Patrick's Day, and he announced there would be a Choctaw scholarship to Ireland. And he explained why, your act of kindness has never been and never will be forgotten in Ireland. It is a sacred bond which has joined our peoples together for all time. And the circle of giving has come back to us with COVID-20. And as you know, the Navajos and Hopi people have been suffering very badly and they put out a GoFundMe appeal. And this was just one of their announcements. Yesterday, the organiser Hopi and Navajo people, Relief Fund Cassandra Begay, posted on the GoFundMe page where she offered her heartfelt thanks to the people of Ireland and to Larry Mullen in particular for their continued support. I'm sure you all know Larry Mullen is with U2. He's a musician with U2. We feel real kinship with the Irish, who have shared legacy of colon who have shared a legacy of colonization, and we are truly grateful for Mr. Mullen's donation. And all donations have come from our Irish brethren. Garamaygas and Ahayi. Someday we hope to repay you for these beautiful and meaningful acts of solidarity made during our time of great need. So this relates to when Irish people saw about this GoFundMe appeal, many of them sent money, but they didn't just send money, they included a message saying this is to thank you for what you did for our people during the great hunger. So it really is a circle of giving that is continuing. And if I could finish with the words of a woman who's descended from the Choctaws, Professor Leanne Howe, who has just brought out a book on the 
Choctaw gift. And she talks about Ima, which is the Choctaw word for the spirit of giving. There's no exact translation. And she talks about why these gifts were given in 1847. Ima lives inside the people. What did we expect in return? Nothing tangible but friendship. And that has lasted across the generations. More precious than gold. And with Leanne's beautiful words, I'd like to finish this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. And I would just like to take a moment to see if anyone has a question for Christine before we sign off today. If you do, just type it in the comments field. Um, I don't, you went over this briefly, but I was wondering, if the Cherokee and Choctaw, do you know of any of the other tribes that donated? I haven't come any, across any in um, America, in Canada, and it's their language is so um, elusive. Um, a government official talks about our red brethren, that's their favorite phrase, um, or they're called children of the forest. So they're not named, it's very generically given. I would say if people could, I hate the expression, but drill on down into the newspapers, they would come up with something. I think especially in the American newspapers, I've pretty well exhausted, I think, the Irish newspapers trying to find more examples. Um, so I, there are more, and the Irish, um, the London Times refers to a dozen. So there are definitely more, but it's just, and again, this happens with poor people. They're not even honoured or dignified by giving their individual names. They're just labelled. So the children of the forest are red brethren. Um, but I'm sure the information is there and hopefully it can be uncovered. Um, the Cherokee donations are not that well known. And I only discovered them because I actually went to their Cherokee newspaper, which is in the Library of Congress some years ago. And they obviously noted. But now I would love to go back and look at it with a different eye, looking to see if other um, nations gave as well. Um. Uh, there's another question. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Are you able to see it? I can read it to you if not. Can you read it? I can't unless I... Yeah. Can I stop I sharing? your PowerPoint now, yeah. Okay, so stop sharing. This is new technology for me. It has to be from my cousin. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Just now the chapter was made known. Yeah, it's separate. Um, in how the Choctaw and Cherokee gift was known in its receipt and honor and separate from the general money. So the Cherokee gifts actually, the, I partly answer that, the Cherokee gifts I came across in their newspaper. So they actually wrote about it. So I knew that they had given it. And then the Philadelphia Committee worked with the British Relief Association. And even though they were London based, the British Relief Association's papers are in the National Library of Ireland. And I've actually gone through all of their papers. And so I've seen it there. Um, the Choctaw gift, the Society of Friends kept beautiful, meticulous records. And so they are actually listed in both the correspondence and in the list of donations. So they are, there is documentary evidence. And then in terms of the Choctaw, which seemed to get more no notice, many, I just gave example of two newspapers, but many newspapers in Ireland in June, 1847, referred to the gift from the Choctaws. So there is definitely documentary evidence. Um, the Canadian donations from what we call now the First Nations are uh, referred to by the Governor General of Canada in his report to the British government. So they exist in parliamentary papers. Again, probably you're a Canadian historian, if they could drill down into the newspapers, I'm sure could find more. So, um, and there's tantalizing glimpses. I Somebody told me that the Grey Nuns of Montreal, who did great work in 1847, opening fever sheds for the famine Irish, apparently some of the local Native Americans came and gave food for the people in the sheds. But again, I haven't seen documentary evidence of that. So I have only spoken about the, um, the donations I have the documentary evidence for. 
Okay, there is another question now. I'll put it up there. For you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, general, the famine we called in Ireland, sorry, we called the Great Famine. I know in America it's more the Great Hunger. Um, I'm always fascinated by how people with money and power treat people who don't have either. And that sort of led me to initially look at how poor people in Ireland were treated in the 1830s and 1840s. And then I, when I did it, and I, not much had been written, I didn't expect there was so much kindness that so many people throughout the world and people who themselves had so little had reached out to Ireland in her time of need. And I just thought it was a story that needed to be told. And that fascinated me. And today I just, we're living in tough times. And I think we always have to look for, that always, and we find it, there is always humanity, even in the toughest of times. And sometimes these stories and the history and knowing about the Choctaws can inspire us to look for that humanity. Um, if I can just give one example, which I think is a great example of humanity in tough times. During the COVID, I've been trying to give to charity every month, I give anyway. But anyway, and because of the Choctaw gift, I wanted, and I knew Native Americans were suffering badly. And I wanted to give um, a donation just to the Choctaws. Again, that was my circle of giving. Um, and I asked one of the Choctaw people, you, how do I do it? Because there's nothing online. I knew the Navajos were, had asked for the GoFundMe. And the response was, um, yeah, we are suffering, but we'll manage. The Navajos need your money. Please send it to them. And I just thought that was such an example of that humanity just carrying on and that circle of giving. And um, I was very moved by that selflessness of the gesture. Um, so there is humanity. And I think we should look to what happened in Ireland in 1847 to inspire us to you know, find that humanity and to try and be positive. It's not always easy, but try and be positive. Yeah, and it's remarkable that all of these other people who had nothing were willing to give. And they oh, an yeah. internet or, or a GoFundMe page, but they knew somehow. Yeah, so well, I just, one of my favorite stories, I didn't talk about it because um, it's an English example. But one of the most moving stories for me was at the time, 1847, the prisons in England were overflowing. So they used decommissioned ships. Some of them would have been used for slavery um, to bring the prisoners on board the decommissioned ships as free dock labor. And this was some of the most dangerous work. And these men mostly worked in chain gangs. And many of them suffered from fever, they caught, etc. But there was one ship, um, Woolwich, and some of the chain gang, they saw parcels going to Ireland and they asked if they could make a donation for Ireland and they were given permission. And so these convicts in England who were brutalized, really brutalized, sent 17 shillings. I mean, a tiny donation in pennies and halfpennies, the smallest currency you could get. And they sent it to Ireland. And I tracked these convicts a year later, they were all dead from fever. So, you know, okay. again, yeah, it was, that always moves me. Here's uh, one more question and then we'll finish. Yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, <laughs> I need to. Um, there was, yeah, one of the amazing things is there was relatively little corruption at the time. Um, and I suppose when you get to have an empire, you know how to keep books in pretty good order. And just the groups that were set up. So the Quakers were scrupulous in record keeping, absolutely scrupulous. And they used their own personnel. So there just seems to have been absolutely no corruption at the time. And then the other massive relief organization, the British Relief Association, that was set up by an English Jewish banker, Lionel de Rothschild, who had no association with Ireland. And he 
brought about in the Committee of Bankers. And again, they were meticulous in terms of their record keeping. So in that sense, it seems that money did reach its target. Um, they employed, again, so many great stories. They um, used a Polish count who was an explorer, and he heard of the famine in Ireland, and he approached their committee in London and asked, could you go to Ireland to help? He wanted no payment, and he just became the saviour of so many. He set up schools in the west of Ireland where children could come every day and get free food. And in order to get it, they had to wash their hands. What are we doing today? So it was just um, his money ran out in 1848. So there seems to have been very little corruption in terms of these committees that were set up. And the fact that they kept their records, most of them survived so meticulously would tell you that. Um, in terms of why did the British government say it was over, they didn't care about the aid coming in. They just wanted to end their own involvement. They just wanted to say, you know, we are washing our hands of Ireland. We've given, we're not giving any more. So it was more about their role in Ireland. They wanted to end in 1847. Okay, sorry, one more because it's an interesting question. Um, so other countries also had the blight the, and Potatoes were growing everywhere, but no country in the world had the dependence on potatoes that Ireland had. And for the reasons I tried to talk about, you know, the colonisation and um, being assessed of good quality land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Ireland was unique in having such a high dependence on potatoes. But the light first came in probably into Belgium and it travelled around Europe, came to England. But again. You know, no country had that high dependence on potatoes or that inbuilt vulnerability after 700 years of colonization. Irish people were mostly very vulnerable because they had so few resources. So Ireland was unique in terms of its dependence on potatoes, but yeah, the blight. And blight is a virus, so it hasn't gone. You, we still have that particular blight with us today. We just know how to treat it. I they didn't have time. I read your Irish America article about this, and I think you mentioned that the Highlanders, the Highlands in Scotland also were affected. Yes, and the Highlands are interesting because obviously the Highlands of Scotland were part of the British Empire, part of the British Empire, part of the United Kingdom. And there's a book, and it's very good, it's called you know, The Highlands Famine. But the Highlands were different. There were evictions, there was emigration, and um, people didn't marry, people didn't have children, the usual. But nobody died in the Highlands of Scotland. And this is it a famine if nobody dies? Certainly there were food shortages. And the other interesting thing, you may have heard of Charles Trevelyan, who was um, not a politician, but a government official. He was the Secretary of the Treasury. So he was in charge of the giving out the money. And he was very puritanical in his approach. Um, he believed the Irish were lazy. He believed they were being punished by God. So the government shouldn't give too much relief. It would make them lazier. But he was more sympathetic to the Scottish people. And when government relief came in, he said it should go to Scotland first because they are more deserving than the Irish. He really hated the Catholic religion. So there were all sorts of factors at play, you know, providentialism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Irishness. So you know, when the government said the famine's over, they really felt that this you know, what ha would happen, would happen, what's the phrase? Um, um, it is what it is. You know, that was the equivalent in its day. It is what it is. And if people died, they felt it would be good. They actually felt it would be good because Ireland was overpopulated. And thank you for all the thank yous. I'm just seeing some. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you, Sean. Oh. I wanted to flash some of those up there just so you can see thank all you. the people. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And uh, wonderful program. Uh, just next week and on Tuesday at noon, we will have some colonial mu music from Fair May uh, to young people, a, a duet. And uh, this Thursday, as I mentioned, because today is basically suffrage day, we start our program on the struggle for women's suffrage uh, Thursday at 6.30. So hope to see you all then. And thanks again to Christine and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Sean, particularly. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.